Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fourth in our series of webinars hosted by the Phil Fisher Silicon Valley office. We'll be starting in just a couple of moments. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fourth in our series of field official webinars. Each month we've been looking at practical issues arising from discrete points under GDPR. We've tackled data subject rights and controller to controller arrangements in the recent months. And this time we're covering the most headline hitting aspects of data privacy at the moment, and that's personal data breaches. We're going to look at how to prepare for, investigate and respond to a dreaded breach. As always, we've put listeners on mute throughout the webinar, but feel free to ask us any questions using the comment box. And if we don't get a chance to cover them during the webinar, we'll answer them when we circulate the slides afterwards. You may have noticed it's a new voice welcoming you this morning. Um, I'm Megan Ward and I'm a trainee solicitor in the privacy team out here in Silicon Valley. I've been over here for just a, nearly three months now and very much enjoying my time in the Bay Area so far. I'm joined today by three of my brilliant colleagues um, who will be all who all specialise in handling data security incidents. First up, Felicity Fisher. Flick's a director in our team who specialises in European privacy and digital regulation. Flick's an English qualified solicitor, has been practising law out here in the Bay Area for five years now. Next up, we've got Alden Takatimu. Alden is a senior associate in the Phil Fisher team, specialising in privacy and information security. Alden is New Zealand qualified solicitor and barrister but spent most of his career practicing in the UK and moved over from Phil Fisher's London office earlier this year. We've also, we're also joined today by Paul Lamois. Paul has recently joined the Phil Fisher team as a director and specializing in global privacy, data protection and information security. Paul is both French qualified and a member of the state bars of the District of Columbia and New York. He also has every IAPP qualification there is. <laughs> well done, Paul. <laughs> um, before joining Phil Fisher, Paul worked in-house um, in, and has practiced law in Hong Kong and Switzerland. Is that, is that correct, Paul? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so today, as I said, we'll be focusing on handling data breaches under GDPR. Probably should just flag up that there are, of course, other um, regimes that organisations need to be aware of if they suffer a personal data breach, for example, the EU's Network and Information Security Directive. But as we only have 45 minutes today, we're going to stick with obligations under GDPR. But watch this space, we might do a future webinar on those uh, those data breach regimes. Yeah, that could be the next, next <laughs> topic coming up. Um, so, Data breaches have inevitably attracted media attention and are a high enforcement priority for the regulators. However, the fines that we have been levied in recent months due to the timing of the incidents have been capped at the level available under previous legislation. But as we're all aware, the fines are significantly higher under GDPR. Also, just last month, the UK courts, for example, have ruled on their first employee class action for data breaches in which supermarket chain Morrisons was found liable for a data breach carried out by an employee four years ago. And so this demonstrates that the potential cost to organisations are ensuring compliance and also increases liability exposure. 
For breaches that have occurred after the 25th of May, we're yet to see any fines issued so far, although we know that investigations um, are underway. It has been reported that since the 25th of May, regulators have received around 18,000 data breach notifications. That's around 160 per day. But as we've said, whilst investigations are underway, we're yet to see the implication of the GDPR fines. So to kick us off with our questions, we're going first to Alden. So Alden, what should lawyers do in the first 24 hours when the call comes in that a security incident may have occurred? Thanks. Thanks, Megan. Morning, everybody. Um, well, the, the number one thing, I believe, that, that, that the lawyer's role in the first 24 hours when breaches happen is to, to not panic and not, not add to the chaos which is, which is inevitably occurring in your, in your, in your organisation. Um, now, uh, I'm not saying that in some organisations breaches don't happen and you follow your, your pre-prepared breach preparedness plans and incident plans to the letter of the law, but the vast majority of the breaches I've worked on, um, usually people are running around like headless chickens, they're trying to, they're trying to establish, establish the facts. Now, as the lawyer, you can't be you can't be one of those headless chickens, and you can't you you can't add to the chaos, particularly because um, you, your organisation is going to be looking to you um, to to sort of keep calm and and establish give give them some legal guidance on on that important uh, first twenty four hours, but without without interfering with what um, you know, the IT teams need to do. Um, and what the various other teams need to do will be involved in the process. Um, the second thing you need to do is you need to establish what process you are you are following. Uh, is there is there a breach breach response plan or an incident response plan um, in your organisation? Um, often often there is one, but um, sometimes they're not used. As I said, in, in breaches, sometimes the business doesn't know. Um, that, that they exist. Um, so sometimes your first job as, as a lawyer is to uh, let people know that there is actually a process or a procedure uh, in place. Um, if if there is a procedure, is there is there a cert or a security incident response team that needs to be convened? If there is no such process, you know, get get the get the people uh, get the people in the room. Work out work out what needs to what needs to happen. Um, and really focus focus on what your job as a lawyer or the DPO or the compliance person um, is. As I alluded to before, your job is 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 to guide the process. It's to it's to do the legals or the or the, or the DP work um, on, on the process. It's not to um, it's not to tell the security teams or the IT teams uh, what what they need to do. So you know some of those tasks might be. You know, do you need to engage a, a forensics uh, provider? Um, you know, do you, if you don't have one on retainer, do you? You know, someone's going to need to put an engagement letter in place. Somebody's going to need to put NDAs in place. Um, and my colleague's going to talk a little bit more about that afterwards. The, the the third thing you need to do is you need to you need to establish uh, the facts. It sounds it sounds really simple, but you've really got to understand in that first 24 hours uh, who knows who knows what. Um, you know, when when was the when did the incident happen? Is it still occurring? Um, you know, what what containment uh, steps uh, have, have you put in place? Um, you know, and then start start to think about uh, what what again what what your job is in the process and what what you need. To do your job. So, what type what type of breach has happened? Are, are you dealing with uh, something which is you know, a, a hacker or, or an external threat? Um, what what sensitivity of, of, of data? What volume of data are we talking about? Um, what what countries? What what jurisdictions? Um, all of all of those all of those sort of things, and start to start to document. Um, what's what's going on? So so many breaches that we work on, um, 
it's such an important step just just getting into into one place whether it's an email or whether it's a file note that never you know never leaves your desk just getting an understanding in that first 24 hours about who who knows what because often you know often you've got various different conversations going on various different email chains whatever i think that the lawyer's job has to be to bring bring that sort of factual matrix together into into one place yeah and it's sorry it's Blake here and i also just add that having been on the end of a number of incidents where as outside counsel it's friday afternoon and you're really looking forward to your weekend and suddenly you get the call that there has been an incident um, and actually what's happened is that the organization has, has usually sat on it for a few days trying to gather the facts uh, and pull together the information but actually if you can get outside counsel involved within the first 24 hours I think that's a really useful, um, or at least once you've got the initial facts in place, because they can help guide the process as well. Um, and kind of leaving it till Friday afternoon um, means we're always in a frantic scramble to do things like deal with notifications when the regulators, um, you know, are going to shut up shop for the weekend. The other thing I would say is that in the first 24 hours, it's really important to start to manage the internal communication process. And we will talk a bit about that in future slides, but things like it's an absolutely obvious one, but still people trip up on this. Do not call it a breach until you know that it is definitely a breach. Um, so you need to, to make sure that those internal emails that are flying around, you know, raising the red flag um don't mention that it's a breach and, and and start calling it an incident until we're absolutely sure that we're dealing with a breach yeah we were involved in a breach recently where by the time we got engaged i think about 60 percent of the of this particular company's workforce had been copied into a mail which was entitled omg we have a breach yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, avoid that that actually leads us nicely on to the next question, which is for Flick. We know that all personal data breaches are security incidents, but not all security incidents are data breaches. So when does an incident become a breach? Yeah, so thanks, Megan. So, well, we've got the definition of personal data breach in our school for uh, in the GDPR and it basically means a breach of security a breach of security leading to accidental or unlawful destruction loss alteration unauthorized disclosure of or access to personal data and the, and the crucial thing in, here is that it needs to involve personal data so that's the first thing um, and the second thing is that um, it include includes breaches that are the result of both accidental and deliberate causes so as Megan said, not all incidents are breaches, um, but in most cases, um, if they involve personal data and you've got any, uh, you know, any kind of unlawful destruction, loss, et cetera, that falls within that definition, you've definitely got a breach. Now, the definition is actually extremely broad when you start to uh, break it down. Um, so it can basically be defined widely as a security incident that has affected the confidentiality, integrity or, or availability of personal data. So that in practice means there will be a personal data breach whenever personal data has been lost, destroyed, corrupted or disclosed, um, or if someone accesses, accesses the data or passes it on without proper authorization. It can also include a scenario where data has been made unavailable, i.e. and the example that the regulators will often provide is that it's been um, encrypted by ransomware or accidentally lost or destroyed. Um, and that uh, the idea that um, the data is unavailable can also include temporary unavailability unless that temporary um, unavailability was due to some kind of planned maintenance or downtime. Um, and so recital 87 of the GDPR is quite clear that when a security incident takes place, you've got to quickly establish um, whether a personal data breach has occurred uh, and then promptly take steps to try um, and address it. And I'm going to talk a little bit next about, um, you know, when the clock starts um, running in terms of notifications. Hi, uh, uh, this is Paul speaking, and you know, just to add on to what you, you know you just said, you know, I, I think you know what you, you mentioned you know, is really crucial. You know, data breach is not only uh, you know what people commonly think about in you know, the data breach. We lost access, uh, someone, an unauthorized person had access to the information. You know, data breach is actually much broader in the GDPR, right? Because uh, you know, as you mentioned, uh, you know, as if you have lost. Uh, uh, 
if it, the data was lost, if it was destroyed, altered, and so forth, then there would be a data breach. And you know, this means that you know it's not so much an issue you know of data leakage; it's also a question you know, of do you have a backup of the information? Are you able to recover the information uh, you know very quickly? Because uh, you know, if you don't have any good quality backups, if you're not able, if you don't have a process in place, you know to quickly restore the data, uh, you know to to be back. Uh, up to speed, then uh, you know this means that you know uh, you you have a data incident uh, which uh, uh, which may need to be reported, even though there was no uh, data stolen, even though the data was just destroyed. Yeah, and I think that's it. another important thing is that the actual definition of personal data of a personal data breach or a data breach doesn't um, that whether or not it falls within that definition doesn't require an initial risk assessment. So if you've got something that, you know, data has been lost, stolen, or there's been an, um, you know, an issue with availability of the data, at that point, you've got a breach. And the second assessment would then be, okay, so we've got a breach. And then you start to do your risk analysis to determine whether or not you may need to subsequently, because of that breach, um, notify individuals or regulators. Thanks, Vic. So next question also for you. Um, as you mentioned, who do we need to notify and when? Um, so um, your notific notification obligations will vary depending on whether you're acting as a controller or processor in relation to the affected data. So if you are acting as a controller of the data, you've got two notification obligations to be aware of. Your first uh, notification obligation will be to notify the regulators without undue delay and latest within 72 hours of becoming aware of the incident if it's likely to result, if that incident is likely to result in risk uh, to the affected individual's rights and freedoms. Um, and then the second, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about what that means in practice, the second notification obligation to consider is your potential um, obligation to notify the affected individuals. Um, and there's a slightly higher risk threshold for that. So unlike the scenario where you have to notify the regulators if there's any risk to the individuals, the bar is slightly higher for notification to the affected individuals. So that would only apply if, there, um, if you know, there's a high risk um, to the um, you know rights and freedoms of the individuals, and in that case, you've got to notify them without undue delay, i.e., as soon as reasonably uh, possible. So, going back to the first notification obligation, um, so you wouldn't need to notify the regulators if it's unlikely to result in risks and any kind of risk to the underlying. Um, individuals and so there is an, an initial risk assessment that needs to be done and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, shortly but the article 29 working party has issued some guidelines on um, what to consider uh, when it comes to uh, breach notification um, obligations so worth checking those out because it goes into some you know significant detail but it basically provides a couple of scenarios where the risk may be low enough not to trigger notification obligations. Um, and it includes scenarios like the data is publicly available, the data has been encrypted or securely hashed or salted, and the key remains confidential and um, can't be, in, you know, can't be accessed. Um, there's some kind of temporary loss of access, but you've been able to restore it. Um, or if it's been accidentally sent to a third party, but that recipient is actually a trusted third party, like your lawyers or someone like that, that wouldn't necessarily create any risk in that scenario. But then in any event, whether or not you decide to notify or not, you should always be documenting the decisions that you're making and the, and the rationale for those uh, decisions. The other point to flag here is, is that notification can be done in phases. So if you haven't necessarily got all the information and all your house in order yet, um, but the, the clock is ticking and you're getting to the end of the 72 hour period, you should definitely get in and start to notify the regulators and let them know that you need, need a little bit more time to complete your initial investigation. And then, um, you know, you can follow up and should follow up without undue delay as and when the information becomes available. You know, just because you haven't got everything you need, don't sit on that notification. You should do it because you've got the ability to do it in phases. Um, 
And then in terms of who you should notify, this often is something I really recommend that as an organization, you figure out who, who your regulator is and who you need to be notifying. Because there is quite a legal assessment to potentially do to determine, for example, if you are um, if you're able to identify a lead supervisory authority, and there's a whole legal analysis behind that, uh, but if you have identified the lead supervisory authority, then you should be notifying them. Or if you're based outside of Europe and you've, you've appointed an EU representative, the guidance from the regulators suggests you should notify in the country where your EU representative is based. Or alternatively, you may have to notify all of the affected um, member states where all of the um, affected data subjects are. Um, but if in doubt, the guidance suggests that you should notify where the breach actually takes place. Um, so um, when it comes to notifying the data subjects, you've got to do that without undue delay, um, i.e. as soon as, as you can. And there are a couple of exemptions to that notification requirement. Um, so if for example, the data has been rendered unintelligible because you've got state-of-the-art encryption, tokenization applied to that data, or it's been, you know, pseudonymized. You may be able to get out, or it may be sufficiently um, low, lower risk at that point because it's unintelligible. Or if, if following the incident, you've taken enough steps to try and negate some of that, that risk, and you've taken a number of mitigation steps so as to lower the potential risk to the individual so it's no longer high risk. At that point, you wouldn't necessarily have to notify the data subject. So that really emphasizes the importance in that first, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours, really getting stuck into taking steps to mitigate the risk to the individuals and, and addressing containment because it can actually mean you don't end up having to notify the individuals. Or if, if notification would involve disproportionate effort. And I think that's going to be very narrowly construed. So that might apply, for example, if you don't have the contact details for all of the individuals who've been affected. Um, but nonetheless, you would still be expected to make some kind of public communication or notify by similar means. Um, and then the, the other really key point here is that um, the clock starts ticking on all of this, so for the 72-hour period, uh, once you've become aware of the breach. Um, and the guidance suggests that you, you know, awareness kicks in and you will be aware of the breach once you have um, a sufficient degree of certainty that an incident has taken place. So in practice, that means you've got a short period to sort of address and investigate the facts to figure out whether the incident is in fact a breach. And a lot of people play around with that time period and use that period of investigation and, you know, until you become aware to kind of extend your, um, your time frame and give you a little bit more leverage um, to investigate and not be rushing around. So if, if you notice... Um, you know, 72 hours kicks in as soon as you become aware. So you've got a bit of time there to just figure out whether or not you've got an incident, but you haven't got days, you've got to do it, you know, pretty quickly. The other thing to be aware of is that that 72 hour time frame includes weekends. So just because the regulators have shut up shop, you've still got a notification obligation if that 72, hour, uh, 72 hours ends over a weekend period when, for example, their hotlines may be closed, which they are. Um, so turning to if you're a processor, your obligation is slightly different. So if you are a processor, the bulk of your, um, your notification obligations will be addressed in your contract with the controller. And you are contractually required to agree that you will inf inform the controller without undue delay. So again, as soon as possible. But notice there's no risk threshold for a processor notification. So in many ways, if you're a processor, your notification obligations are much broader because you, you're not making that initial assessment of whether it's, there's any risk or there's a high risk to the individuals. As soon as you've got a breach, you've got to notify the controller and you should also be checking what your contract says because you may have committed to certain timeframes, even though legally you're only required to agree um, that it will be without undue delay. Thanks, Vic. So as you said, the risk threshold for notifying individuals and regulators is different. So how do we assess the risk? 
Yeah, so um, again, there's no exact science to this um, and people get a bit nervous around doing this risk assessment because they don't want to get it wrong. Um, but there is very, you know, it, it's supposed to be an objective assessment, but there's no kind of firm criteria. You know, sometimes you see those yes, no, yes, no, and you end up at, you know, high risk or low risk. There's none of that to help us here. Um, we do have to turn to the guidance and see what the regulators sort of think we should be factoring into this risk, risk assessment. Um, but you've basically got to consider all the possible consequences of the breach and both the likelihood and severity of the impact to the individuals. And that, when you're looking at the impact to the individuals, that can be uh, extremely broad. So it covers both physical, material or non-material damage. Um, so it could also include things like significant, whether or not the individual is likely to suffer significant economic or social disadvantage, um, you know, loss of control over their personal data, a limitation of their rights, and that wouldn't just be privacy rights. Any kind of discrimination or identity theft or fraud, financial loss, all of that kind of stuff, damage to reputation, that should be factored in uh, to considering the impact on the individuals. And now, unlike when you do a DPIA and you need to think through the risks that, um, you know, that, that may be suffered for, or the risk of harm to the individuals, a DPIA kind of focuses on the likelihood of harm in a breach scenario. But in an actual breach scenario, the focus should be on the resulting risk um, of the impact of the breach. That's a slightly different focus. So really, you know, we're being asked to consider the specific circumstances of the breach. Um, and there are a long list of things that the regulators sort of say that we should all be looking into. And, you know, you've got to look at the type of breach, um, the nature, sensitivity and volume of personal data. So the more sensitive the data, the higher the risk um, and likelihood of harm to the individual. So if you've got things like health data, or identity documents or financial uh, data, that is probably going to be uh, or likely to result in a higher risk um, of, of harm to the individuals. Or if you've got a large volume of data subjects, that would be another high, higher risk scenario. Or you've also got to look at the ease of identification of the individuals. So has, if the data has been effectively pseudonymized and it may you know, present a lower risk, um, than if it's in a you know, straightforward, identifiable form. Um, the severity of the, con uh, of the consequences, you know, who is it being sent to if, it's been in, uh, if there's been an unauthorised disclosure, if it's a trusted recipient, again, it may be lower risk. Um, it, you know, look at the special characteristics of the ind individual, they children or vulnerable adults. Um, and again, the number of affected individuals, those are all the things that you need to be building into your risk assessment. And you should be documenting that risk assessment and showing um, that you've thought through the issues and are able to prove, you know, how you've come to your assessment of risk. Thanks, Flick. Um, so next question for Paul. We know that there's obligations to notify regulators and individuals, but mainly to consider notifying third parties, for example, law enforcement. So when do we need to reach out? Thank you very much. My proposal is actually you know, uh, not to wait for a data breach you know, to actually happen, to actually start finding out you know, who you should contact you know, within law enforcement. You know, my proposal is actually to try to engage with law enforcement before a cyber security incident happens, because it's always very good to have a point of contact and, and you know, to build a pre-existing relationship with someone working within law enforcement so that you know whenever an incident happens, you actually have a point of contact. You can actually just reach out to the person and this will facilitate you know, any future interaction that you will have with uh, law enforcement. And it's always good to build this uh, trusted relationship. You know, when a data breach happens, you know, most of the time, uh, like Eldon mentioned earlier, everybody's panicking, you have 72 hours. It's not necessarily a good idea to wait uh, uh, you know, for that 72 hours to happen to then say, oh, well, who do I reach out uh, in, within law enforcement and to just call the hotline, you know, that's going to take time, you know, you have to do some research and so forth, and they may pass you from one desk to another, and, you know, it's, uh, you have very little time, the 72 hours is very quick, so you should not wait uh, uh, to engage uh, with them. And then, you know, when the incident takes place, you know, my... The, the starting point should always be, you know, to first, you know, examine, you know, within your organization, especially if you are working in a large organization, you know, examine, you know, which uh, law enforcement agencies, you know, are really in contact uh, with your organization, you know, maybe, uh, you know, especially if you are working in a large organization, you know, maybe the data breach has already been, 
it has already appeared, you know, in in the in, uh, in the media. Maybe you know there has been someone you know who is already blackmailing you on Twitter or on social media. Uh, and you, you know it's always good to check, uh, you know, whether someone has already contacted you because you want to be, you know, as an organization, you want to be speaking in a single voice. You don't want to, uh, uh, you know, to have you know multiple people contacting and reaching out to law enforcement and. Uh, you know, maybe the information may not necessarily be the same, and you know, it's it's always an issue. You know, if uh, you, you you cannot get your house in order, so always make always start by make by checking. You know, whether your organization has already been contacted with uh, uh, has already been contacted by law enforcement, and then you should also take into account uh, uh, you know existing uh, uh, existing relationships as well. You know, as I mentioned earlier, and then the market practice. Uh, uh, you know, you know, maybe in the you know in one specific jurisdiction, you know, maybe there is an expectation that you know uh, you are supposed to reach out to the law enforcement, you know, within uh, you know immediately, and you know in, in that case you have to do that. And then in relation to uh, existing relationships, you know, sometimes the organization may already be speaking with law enforcement in relation to another incident or whatever, and it's always very bad, you know, if you don't tell the law enforcement. Uh, you know, with whom you are already speaking with, you know, that there is a new incident or whatever. So, so that's why, you know, it's always important to check, you know, are you already in contact with law enforcement? And, you know, in that case, well, uh, you, you need to leverage them. And, you know, in many cases, it's prudent to engage, you know, with Europol, the FBI, local law enforcement authorities. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very good to, to be able to leverage the expertise in evidence gathering. And many times, you know, they, you know, they have delegated teams. They have, you know, lots of uh, contacts within the industry and so forth. And then uh, they would be able to uh, to help you as well. You know, maybe they are aware of a specific, you know, uh, threat, you know, which is targeting a specific industry. Uh, you know, maybe they are aware, for example, in relation to ransomware. You know, maybe they are already aware, you know, of uh, of this type of ransomware attack, and they would be able to help you, you know, to to unlock your computer uh, and um, you know, it's always a good idea as well, you know, uh, be, uh, to to engage with them because they can help you as well uh, uh, to make sure that the evidence can be used in uh, future court proceedings and uh, and investigations. Uh, you know, having having said that, you know, it's always important to, to to bear in mind that you know many times you have investigations which would you know begin in one country, and you know, especially if you're working in a large international organization, you know, you would have uh, an investigation which would start in one country, and then it would just Cross over to another jurisdiction, and that's why you know it's always important to you know to, to consider as well you know uh, all the the jurisdictions which may be impacted, and you know uh, and when you reach out to law enforcement, you don't just reach out to the law enforcement in one specific country. You know you may have to do it for uh, a whole range of uh, different countries because you operate in those countries, and uh, the data breach uh, may have an impact in those countries. Thank you, Paul. Um, so moving on to communications during the incident, an incident even, how do we maintain privilege? You know, privilege, uh, legal privilege is a very important topic and, you know, you should always keep it at the heart of your incident uh, response strategy because, you know, when whenever you have, you know, discussions between uh, the attorneys and, and the clients, you know, within the context of providing legal advice, that is uh, confidential conf uh, communication, which may be protected and you may not necessarily want, you know, those uh, communications to be, uh, you know, to be used uh, and to be brought up, you know, in the context of uh, uh, upcoming litigation, which, uh, uh, which, which may appear. And therefore, you know, it's always very important to make sure that you protect attorney client privilege, you know, wherever it exists. Uh, the protection, you know, it, it varies in scope and in application, uh, depending on the country. It's not a universal protection. So, uh, you know, some countries recognize uh, attorney client privilege, uh, others do not. And therefore, you know, again, if you operate in many countries, it's important to, for you, you know, to, to map out and to understand, you know, the, uh, the context, the scope of uh, legal privilege in the different countries. Uh, and so that's uh, that would be the first point, you know, um, understanding uh, the legal privilege law in a different country. And then I, I would say the, the first step would be, you know, uh, in order to maintain privilege, uh, you you want to retain outside counsel right from the start. Uh, you know, whenever you be, you believe that uh, uh, 
whenever you are aware you know, of an incident taking place, it's, it's good to retain outside counsel early and to keep them involved in discussions. You want to maintain privilege. You know, many times uh, you don't know at the beginning whether it's a real data breach, maybe just um, an incident you know, with no uh, further bearing, but then uh, engaging external counsel you know, right from the start helps you to maintain the privilege uh, in case the, uh, the incident turns out to be a data breach. Uh, in order to maintain privilege, uh, you should uh, have external counsel you know, responsible for providing the legal advice. They should be the ones retaining forensic cybersecurity experts and to direct uh, response actions to protect uh, the investigation and uh, internal communications. Uh, um, you know, one important point as well, you know, is to make sure that you know when you are getting uh, advice in the context of uh, uh, an incident, uh, you should not assign you know legal functions to outside vendors who are not attorneys. Uh, unless you know their function is outside of your general area of expertise and you need their advice you know to uh, in order for you to, to render your legal, legal advice you know the, the the reason for that is that you know now nowadays you have lots of uh, consultants uh, especially you know, after the gdpr you have lots of consultants who are you know providing advice in relation to uh, data security gdpr advice and so forth and uh, in, in a while, what they, they may do, you know, maybe maybe interesting. The, the problem that you have here is that you know their their advice will not be protected uh, under the attorney client privilege, and it may therefore be used, you know, against you uh, in the context of litigation. Uh, another important uh, tip is, uh, you know, whenever you have an incident, you should separate the incident response team from the team conducting a, the investigation to aid the legal department. Uh, so this is actually, you know, what happened in the uh, uh, target case. So you had this uh, data breach uh, at uh, target, uh, target being you know, a, a, a very large uh, uh, chain of, of supermarkets uh, here in the United States. And, uh, you know, what target did was that they, they retained uh, outside counsel, and then they, uh, they had a team which was in, uh, in charge you know, only of providing you know privileged uh, advice to aid the legal department and uh you know as, as often in the united states you had a class action you had a number of plaintiffs who were saying well they want to have access to the information you know provided by uh, uh the, you know the, the the legal team and uh, what, what happened here was that uh, uh the plaintiffs were arguing well investigating a data breach you know that's you know that's the ordinary cost of business you know you have to fix the incident you have to uh, uh you know you have to to help the the customers who are the victims of the breach and so forth and therefore you know this is uh, something which is does not fall you know under the, uh, legal advice however the the courts here say that well actually because uh there was a separation you know between the two teams uh, you had an incident response team which was providing uh, investigation. Uh, they were, you know, trying to determine what happened, how to fix it, and so forth. And then, in parallel, you had a separate team which was, uh, you know, in charge of uh, uh, providing legal advice. That separate team uh, engaged, you know, forensic experts and so forth. Uh, and, you know, in, in that context, uh, it was uh, possible, you know, to protect uh, uh, the, you know, the, the the confidentiality of the of the of the communication. So always make sure that you separate the two teams. Thank you, Paul. So from a broader communications perspective, Eldon, what should organizations be thinking about when devising a communication strategy? Thanks, Megan. <clears throat> well, my colleagues have, have sort of stolen my thunder on the first two points, but I will, um, so I'll keep it as brief as possible. And, Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my excellent colleagues. Um, so internal, in terms of the internal messaging, as uh, as we mentioned right at the outset, uh, don't don't call it a breach. Don't don't have myriads of emails talking about about breaches and for all the reasons that Paul's just talked about. All of that stuff might be might be discoverable. So so from from your internal comms perspective, uh, establish early on what the means via which you're you're going to communicate, um, and then you know, once you're past that investigation stage, also consider how how you're going to message uh, you know, the fact of the breach happening to to staff. It, it could be that staff are, are affected as as individuals, but also 
from, from a general perspective, uh, how are we going to message staff, how are we going to evolve uh, HR in that process or, or, or anybody else in, internally. Um, in terms of the, the external uh, messaging, uh, Flick's, Flick's going to talk about, or, or one of my excellent colleagues is going to talk about uh, the contents of the notification on the next page, so I won't, I won't talk about that in terms of the, the regulatory uh, notification obligations, but you, you want to be thinking about how how best you can uh, you can you can send that external message if, if you if you need to now we, we already mentioned earlier that uh, you may not be able to contact individuals um, directly you might have their, their contact details so you need to think about you know what you know whether it's by one of your platforms or a website how you're going to notify uh, individuals of of that breach um, and then Obviously, anybody else outside of the organisation. Um, I don't know if we've brought up the. Uh, I don't think we've mentioned the dreaded insurers, um, but they they are a, an external party alongside law enforcement, etc., who who may well um, need to be uh, need to be kept kept abreast. Now, uh, and if you are acting as a as a processor, now I know that we talked about this uh, briefly, and, and in one sense, taking a pure GDPR view. As a processor, you don't you don't have a uh, a risk assessment uh, to make if, if you determine that a personal data breach has happened. Uh, you need to you need to notify your controller customers. Um, so, in preparation for for doing that, uh, you you need to have a, a clear idea of who those who those customers are and and how to how to contact them. I think a really important decision to make is that whether uh, whether the, those communications with those controller customers are going to be are going to be business led or or legal led um, conversations. Um, and I think you can there's there's no there's no right or wrong answer in that, but but, but certainly you need to you need to involve um, the business in that. In that decision making, um, make sure that you know account leads, um, and you know don't be afraid. You know, this might be stated in the obvious, but don't be afraid to treat your important customers uh, with a different a different comms plan to your to your less uh, important important customers. Um, I'm getting I'm getting to hurry up, um, so I will I will move on to uh, Paul. I believe he's going to tell you about what's Thanks, what's involved Roger. in the notification. Um, yeah, we've only got a couple of minutes left, but um, if you're okay to bear with us, that would be great. So, Paul, over to you. Thank you very much. I'm going to be very brief because we're running out of time. Uh, so, what's involved in a notification? Well, uh, many DPAs, you know, they have uh, they have you know established you know online notification forms, and you know uh, you notice that unfortunately the forms you know are quite different you know uh, depending on the on the country. So, even though you have um, you know, the GDPR, which applies you know, across the European Union. Well, in relation to the notification forms, the, the forms are actually quite uh, diff different depending you know, on the on the country that you need to, to make the report to. Uh, you have only 72 hours, you know, remember, to conduct the investigation. And you know, many times when you have a breach, uh, the, the, the breach would be quite complex. And, you know, 72 hours may not necessarily be uh, sufficient, uh, you know, for you to conduct an in-depth investigation into what happened. Um, you know, most of the time, uh, such investigations take much, much longer. And, uh, you know, because you only have 72 hours uh, to make the, uh, the notification, and what you need to do is that you need to, in that case, you know, make an incomplete uh, report uh, to, the, uh, to the authorities within a 72-hour window. And then, you know, when you have more information, then you would provide you know, such information to the authorities uh, when such information becomes uh, available. Um, in relation to the, uh, the, the type of information that you must provide, uh, uh, you know, these this are set out you know, in, in, the, in the slides as well, you know, the contact details for the DPO, uh, the categories and the number of affected individuals, uh, the types of records concerned, the description of the nature of the breach, the likely consequences of the breach, and the measures which have been taken or which are proposed to be taken by the organization following the breach. And I would just quickly add to that, but um, 
as Paul like mentioned before, each of the forms is quite different. So you might be asked to provide additional information over and above that minimum information requirement. The other thing to flag is that most of the forms are online and you can do it, and you can do it through downloading their form and submitting it to them. A couple of them, like the English regulators, have an, a hotline that you can call up, um, but only um, it's only staffed between nine to five UK time. Um, and I believe that the French regulators um, have a have some kind of hotline, but it's only in English at some bizarre time on a Tuesday between four and five or something like that. So be aware that if you're notifying the different regimes, you've got to do it in the local language and uh, the Irish and the English regulators are the only ones you could probably do it in English on the form. Thanks, Nick. So just one final question. Um, before we finish, uh, which is an open question for everyone. I know we've mentioned that even if organisations don't, don't notify, records should be kept. Is there anything else we should think about? Um, I think the, the common thread throughout all of this is make sure you've got your clear audit trail, which documents the steps you've taken and why, um, and, and why you've making key, made key decisions, like to notify or not to notify. Um, the other big thing, to big takeaway is even if the breach is not reportable, so you don't have to notify it to the regulators or the individuals, um, you've got to document the facts, um, its effects and the rem remedial action you've taken to comply with the GDPR requirements. Um, and um, yeah, and, and the final point there is just learn from your mistakes. So there should be a document and wash up process afterwards where you're thinking through with the appropriate stakeholders, you know, what, what mistakes were made and hopefully you can take steps to um, clean up your process. Yeah, I, I'd echo that. There's nothing worse than getting busted with the same breach twice. Yeah. And having done nothing. Uh, about it in, in between time and actually what in between breaches um, and I promise we'll finish very short is it's really important to test your process to maybe do some round table exercises um, there is a brilliant site called I think it's called at bad things daily and it gives you some examples of some you know security incidents that have been happening and what people have been doing about it and that's quite a good resource to go and you know maybe come up with a, a test case to test the organization. It's a bit like muscle memory, you just got to keep running through that policy and process to, to make sure it's efficient and slick. Because when it does happen, a breach can be scary. And if you're trained well enough on how to deal with it, then it becomes a lot easier to manage. And if you engage great external counsel. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's all we've got time for today but thank you very much to my colleagues thank you very much to everyone that tuned in as always we'll make the slides available afterwards and if there is any questions that have come through we'll follow up with our responses to to those as well so thank you very much for tuning in and enjoy the rest of your day bye bye, bye. bye.